I'm, I apologize for the technical issue. I guess you hear me now. And what I was trying to say is that I, I first of all wanted to thank you, Flutura, for the previous panel because she, that's great. She she provided us with a great comprehensive context of the European uh, analysis when it comes to to slap um, to the slap context, and and we can nicely fit the Italian perspective on these. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Francesca De Benedetti, who covers the European politics for the Money newspaper. Um, and together with her, we will be discussing uh, media po media politics and vexatious lawsuits from the Italian perspective. So you might wonder why Italy? Uh, well, in recent months, Italy has drawn the attention of a number of international organizations dealing with press freedom. And the cause of concern has been the rapid successions of defamation lawsuits brought up by very high ranking public figures. And to be sure I invited Francesca because Domani newspaper has been at the center of a number of um, legal, action, legal action threats, but also defamation lawsuits who have been formalized by members of the current government. So just to give us some context and some data, I'm gonna ask her if she can provide us with the number of lawsuits that the money is facing at the moment. And also, I would also ask her, what is it about the kind of articles published by Domani that upset so much Italian politicians. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And I also have thanks to Silk and to all of the free media organizations which are engaged in this talk because they always supported us when, when the government tried to attack media freedom. So I sincerely thank you a lot. Well, so why is Domani so much at the center of these attacks? I must say that Domani is a newly born newspaper. We were born in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. And we tried to offer a new media because there were lots of old media in Italy, but there, was, there weren't so many free independent media. And so that's what we tried to offer. We also have a strong investigative team and so when you ask me why, which are the articles that provoke such reactions? Well, those are articles concerning facts, evidences. So the government didn't sue us because we criticized it, although, of course, we consider ourselves free to do that. But they sued Domani because of the great uh, work my colleagues are doing in trying to discover as an example the links between organized crime and politics, abuses of power, revolving doors, conflicts of interest. And so that's why we are so much at the center of the stage, I might say. And when I talked with the, the Secretary General of the European Federation of Journalists, Ricardo Gutierrez, he, he told me, well, you must feel honored because this really means you are doing a good work. And I do agree with that. But I always have to consider the so-called chilling effect that these slaps have on all of the other colleagues and journalists. If you ask me a number, uh, I must say I asked it by myself, to my editor-in-chief and to my colleagues. And the reality is that no one has a number because there are too many <laughs> lawsuits. But I can tell you which kind of lawsuits we are talking about. First of all, we both have civil and, and criminal lawsuits. Uh, we had the lawsuits from uh, Legas Attilio Fontana wife. Fontana is the governor of the Northern Legion Lombardia and Roberta Dini sued us. Also the Italian multinational energy company Eni sued us. So we don't only attract politicians, we in general attract power. And uh, we also had uh, two different kinds of lawsuits. Uh, when uh, my colleagues wrote about Venice Major Luigi Brugnaro, which is a right-wing politician and a businessman called Zanon sued us. Uh, we have uh, the um, Undersecretary Claudio Durigon that is a switch to sue us. Every time we write about him, he sues us. And so he did it for eight articles. And then last but not least, we have the prime minister uh, challenges us. And so in July, 2024, my editor in chief and my colleague Fittipaldi will have to face a trial. 
Thank you for providing us the context. And, and this really gives me the chance to transition to my last to my next question, uh, which is the hot topic, right? Last November, Prime Minister, current Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni sued um, Emiliano Fittipaldi, your colleague, and Stefano Feltri, the, the director of Domani, over an article in which the author questioned her role in an obscure procurement process of face mask back in early 2020. So having a prime minister suing a newspaper is quite unusual. Um, and I would like to ask you, so how does it feel and what does it tell us? Does it tell us, so the, the current government seems quite oblivious about the debate that is going on in Brussels and Strasbourg about the anti-slap director directive. So how does it feel for an independent newspaper to have the prime minister suing you? Well, first of all, I'm quite concerned because the same governments that use actively those uh, lawsuits against public participation, they are the same that have to decide our future and they have to vote to express their position uh, in the Council of the EU for what concerns the new law, which we might call the Daphne law, although the way the Council is reshaping and boycotting is it makes it really a, a weak law. So I hope uh, that there will be a progress about that. Um, for what concerns Meloni, um, when, when uh, all the media freedom organizations uh, stood by our side uh, when, uh, when we knew about the trial, I, I also talked with the sister of Daphne Caruana Galizia, Corinne Vella, uh, and uh, she, uh, she told me that when it happened to Daphne and to her family to be sued, uh, the former Martha Prime Minister always said, but I'm doing that as a citizen, not as a prime minister. And a few days after, Meloni said the same about what she was doing with Domani. And uh, of course, she's not a simple citizen. She's the prime minister. She, she's in charge, she has lots of power. And so I think it is not a proper thing to do to sue journalists, especially because she did that, not because facts were not true. There are evidences. She, she sues us for the words we use. <laughs> and I think this is a concrete menace to the rule of law. Today, there was a debate at the European Parliament about the erosion of the rule of law, not only in Poland or Hungary, but also in Greece, in Italy. And attacks to media freedom were part of the amendments which were approved at the European Parliament. This, this means that Meloni is not a simple citizen, she's a prime minister, and her attacks to media freedom are attacks to us all as a civil society, as a European civil society. Thank you, Francesca. Um, more recently, uh, another member of the current government, uh, Claudio Durig Durigon, which you mentioned earlier, and he is under secretary of labor, uh, he has triggered an even more serious threat to independent journalists because he has formalized a defamation complaint for an article which has, has, has been published by Domani and authored by your colleagues Giovanni Tiziano and Nello Trocchia. And, and after the complaint of Durigon, you had a couple of police officers knocking at Domani newsroom door and presenting you with a seizure order for an article which was available online, which we could label as bizarre, except it was not. It was a serious threat and a serious um, attempt of intimidating your newsroom. Um, so really the episode echoed across Europe. And I would like to ask you first, um, what does it tell us that, that we are assisting to this sort of intimidation? What does it tell us about the rule of law in Italy when it comes to press freedom? Well, when we hear about Poland and the rule of law, the main issue is the independence of the judiciary. In Italy, we never discussed about this. But at the moment, we can see that there was, uh, there was a, a judicial request to seize an article which was public and online. I also must say that after all the campaign we were doing and all the support and the mobilization we got, Rome's attorney intervened about that, and he said that he considers this act 
not valid and not proper at all. But it had happened. So police came in the newsroom. We have uh, lived this kind of intimidation. And uh, this was also the first time that we, as Domani Trade Union, decided to intervene on that because this was not the first time we were attacked, but enough is enough. And so we had to do something. We denounced uh, this event also at the European level and uh, members of the European Parliament started to do interrogations to uh, take action, to stand by our side, because it was clear that a police ride in the newsroom is a really unusual and improper thing to do, especially if you're trying to seize an article which is public and online, so why are you doing that? I would agree with the European Federation of Journalists when they say, and when Ricardo Gutierrez says, that this is uh, an abuse of this kind of tool. And so it is clear that the meaning is intimidation, not only against Domani, but especially against vulnerable journalists as precarious ones or freelancers. I think this gives us um, a nice example of how civil society can have an impact because the solidarity that you have been granted both domestically and, and internationally has been very beneficial and it's important not to leave you alone. Um, I would like to transition to another question. Um, last October, the then newly appointed Minister of Defense, uh, Guido Corsetto, threatened the lawsuit against Domani, again, for another investigative article, which has been again authored by Emiliano Fittipaldi and Giovanni Tizian. Um, my question is really, was this lawsuit ever formalized? No, it seems that it hasn't. This doesn't mean that it didn't have an impact. Uh, of course, we do not let anyone intimidate us or limit our work. But my editor-in-chief immediately denounced that uh, threatening journalists with legal action is by itself a way to intimidate us. And so, no, there was not any legal action officially, although this action really had an impact. And in this case, too, all of the facts that we reported were true, where there were evidences, the issue was a conflict of interest. And you can find all the documents if you look at the article. So um, Giovanni Tizian, which is one of the authors, uh, confirmed to me that he, he really thought that it was a way to intimidate our work, although we, we will not let it happen, of course. Thank you. Um, I will wrap up with one last question. Um, in the aftermath of the Durogon case, you have been very active on social media denouncing what was going on. And because of that, you have been targeted by a wave of insulting messages on Twitter. So I'm just curious to know um, if your colleagues have been targeted by the same amount of hostility. And do you feel there was any gender component to it? And what can we do to support you? Well, at first, uh, I published a thread in English just because I wanted to have a tool to let people know what happened, even if they didn't speak Italian. So I tried to translate it and summarize what happened. And lots of people retweeted uh, my tweet. Uh, there were commentators from the Financial Times, from Political Europe, uh, members of the European Parliament. So at first, I felt that... Uh, the battle was going on well because we were, we were mobilizing support. But a few days after, I have checked the answers to my tweet and I have found a wave of insults. So my first impression was that someone sent them there to comment because the thing started as a wave. And the second thing that really impressed me, and I was disgusted by that, is, was that I was targeted with um, insults such as bitch or <laughs> uh, things that were related to the fact that I'm a woman. So those haters were trying to undermine my reliability as a reporter and also my dignity as a woman. And uh, my editor-in-chief told me, Francesca, you don't have to be surprised because people always insult me. We are public figures. And I do agree with that. 
I take the responsibility of talking in a free way. But when there is a wave of attacks and people attack me because or using the fact that I'm a woman, this is a really bad sign. I think that there was an attitude, especially from the populist far right, to attack politicians, trade unions, journalists, civil society in general. And we can see that there is a kind of a fight against NGOs as an example. So I think that people somehow are assuaged in, uh, in attacking journalists. But the thing is that we are really trying to do the public interest. And I think it is disgusting that they are attacking us also because of being a woman. Thank you, Francesca. Um, it popped up just one question from uh, Christiana Scoppa, who is asking if Domani got any support from opposing politicians, opposition politicians in Italy. Well, uh, I must say that probably also because I was mobilizing the European level, we got lots of reactions from all of the progressive groups in the European Parliament, and there were also Italian politicians. Uh, we had both the vice president of the European Parliament, Pina Picerno, then Brando Benifei, which is the head of the Italian delegation in the Social Democrats, that actively supported us. We also had Manolo Bri from the left group, Alexandro Giza and Daniel Freund from the Greens. So all of the progressive groups, and of course, Sophie Feld, the liberal Dutch MEP, which did the interrogation. I have not seen any reaction from the right. And I don't think uh, it is normal because you can be uh, a right-wing politician and you can protect and support media freedom, but it didn't happen at all. Thank you. Uh, and I will leave you with these mixed feelings about the reaction of politicians. And thank you so much, Francesca, for joining us. Thank you everyone for attending our panel and wish you a lovely continuation ahead. It was a pleasure.